Hello and welcome to video two of six for assessments and the first personal training client session. Uh, this is Training Made Fun and my name is Mark Baines. And uh, make sure you've reviewed the first video, let alone the kinesiology videos that preceded this before moving on. Uh, the Park U Plus form is a form you want to have your client or potential individual you're going to be training fill out before doing anything with you. A yes question leads to further questions. It's a fairly in-depth form. And, when, and Based upon the answer of those particular questions, it may be determined that it's best to go get medical clearance from a doctor before beginning the program. But this is the starting point, these seven questions. If they say no to all of them, we're solid. We're not concerned about anything vitally significant at this point in time that we do, without knowing more information that we're concerned about. If at any time in a training session, the first time out, or any time thereafter, there ever becomes a problem that's of concern to you, never hesitate to send someone to a doctor. We also highly recommend you have a doctor that you know so the person understands that when you send that person, your client, to that doctor, they become that doctor's patient, that they're taking into account that they know you, so they're not going to make gross overstatements like this person shouldn't exercise at all, or this person should never do a bodyweight squat, which makes no sense, because that's how you get up and down from a chair, or to be clear, a, a toilet, okay? Those are vital things that many people should be able to do no matter what, at least naturally, unless there's some sort of major, major issue, which case they need to be spending time at either a hospital or under the care of a therapist. They can't even sit down onto a chair, right? That's a squat, okay? There's a difference between that and a lot of other variations, which we'll talk about. But that's our starting point, okay? Uh, Parky form, all no's, good, move on. Some yeses, there's more detailed information that's necessary. And then uh, the health history form. This particular health history form is developed, designed by NESTA, the National Exercise and Sports Trainers Association. Um, may not be the same as the one used at the club where you work. Uh, we're asking yes or no questions and looking for details if they say yes. Making sure we ask questions until we're sure we have enough information to know how this person is going to respond to stress. Got to take your time. Make sure you know what you're looking for before you ask the question. Make sure you familiarize yourself with whatever form you're using or asked to use by the club you work for if you've not created your own. If you've created your own, make sure you use it, make it based upon information you've found from other forms, other organizations, other clubs, and make sure it's a very detailed form because the bottom line is we're looking for any yeses that give us concern or pause before moving forward with the program to help someone out. If we say yes, like uh, question number 24, do you have any musculoskeletal pain or injuries? Uh, you'd say yes. Okay, let me go to number, we go 24 down here. We write it number 24, circle it, and state exactly what that musculoskeletal pain or injury is. Pain in the knee, pain in the medial aspect of the knee. When is that pain occurring? Up and down stairs. All the time, most of the time. Okay, there's some important details there. We write that down, and we'll decide later on how we're going to play that when it comes to application of exercise to not exacerbate problems and hopefully prevent problems from occurring in the future. There's a lot of details you need to take here. Most cases, most people don't write enough details the first time they do this. They need to gather more information than they do. Got to ask more questions. Over time, after a while you get used to doing this, you start asking such detailed questions that maybe you don't need to know quite that much detail on. Then the pendulum swings back and gradually become accustomed to it, to answering the asking questions with enough depth, enough depth that we get good information to know how to train this person going forward. Okay? Uh, and then as far as the more important significant stuff beyond just can they exercise without causing pain and basic problems, we want to make sure that nothing horribly bad is going to happen here, like someone's going to die under our care. That is not a, not a good thing at all. And coronary artery, artery disease risk, or possible having a, possibly having a heart attack through blockage of the coronary artery, uh, is a very real risk. And we're going to assess that basic risk with some basic ideas here. Uh, there's low risk from having, having a heart attack based on stuff we're going to do with our client, as long as we're always using a, a high level of standard of care and taking care of somebody. We don't just automatically go intense with someone without knowing a lot more about them whether they're ready for such things. But that said, low risk. Males or females who meet no more than one of the coronary artery disease risk factors, okay, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Moderate risk. They have two or more risk factors. They're moderate, which means maybe we consider getting medical clearance or at least we pay attention more to what's going on to make sure the person stays at a reasonable level before possibly referring them to a doctor. High risk, you have a known diagnosed cardiovascular pulmonary or metabolic disease, asthma, diabetes, uh, any sort of heart-related condition or uh, loss of consciousness, stroke, any of those things are really a red flag to consider moving forward with the uh, possible need for getting a medical clearance. That Park U Plus form will help a great deal with having a better, giving you better clarity for what to do. But whenever you're in doubt, again, get medical clearance. 
That said, here are the risk factors. Number one, the males above 45 years of age or women's above 55. Um, that's a point. And that point meaning risk goes up at those age ranges for each gender. Family history of myocardial infarction. In other words, there's a family history of having heart attacks. Uh, coronary vascularization, sudden death per age of 55 for a male brother or son, sudden death uh, from a heart attack or heart-related issue for a female in your family from a mother, daughter, or sister for 65. If that's the case, it's a point against the person. If they've already got a couple points here, they're already moderate risk. You already need to be assess need to be assessing whether or not maybe you should consider getting medical clearance from a doctor before moving forward with the program. Again, if you're ever concerned, simply look at your personal training client or potential client. And simply say, "Look, you may be just fine, and I hope that you are. Hope there's nothing to be concerned about here. But unless a doctor has specifically told you in a very recent period of time that there's nothing to worry about from engaging in more significant exercise than you already are about your particular problems, then I want you to see a doctor to make sure you're okay. I will not take that risk." If you want, to, if you are willing to take that risk, I am not. You're too important to me. You doing well is too important to me, and your health is important to me. So we're going to make sure we get medical clearance first, okay? That should work. If that doesn't work, you don't want this client. You can't be training somebody who won't check out their own health, who is unwilling to find out what's going on. And I have people in my family, you probably have people in yours, who are unwilling to go to the doctor. And then bad things happen, real bad things. We gotta get medical clearance to be sure everything's okay if we're ever in doubt. Okay? That said, uh, are they a current cigarette smoker? They smoke at all? If they smoke at all in the last six months. That's a risk factor. Okay? Current hypertension, high blood pressure. Now, it's normal if someone's engaging in significant exercise or something super stressful is going on, having a tough day, poor sleep last night. Big, big uh, presentation today, you've had be stressed all day long, there's just so much going on, blood pressure might be up for a day, okay? That's, that's not abnormal. It's not ideal, it's not healthy, but if it's above 140 for the upper number, the systolic, 140 or, uh, millimeters mercury, or diastolic above 90, okay? Either one of those is true, that's high blood pressure. One time on unusual circumstance, it's not something to be overly concerned about. But at the same time, if it's a possibility, this might be a chronic thing or ongoing, I want to make sure a doctor checks them to be sure. And to be clear, if a person's not seen a doctor in a while, well, if they're below 39 years of age, should be seeing a doctor for full medical checkup, including a full physical fitness assessment, uh, physical assessment, uh, every three to five years. If they're 40 to 49 years old, every two to three years. If they're 50 and above, it's at least every other year, if not more often. Okay, uh, that's what we do. If they don't know or have answers here and it's been longer than that time frame, medical clearance. Uh, hypercholesterolemia, high cholesterol. Uh, that's only taken through a blood test. High blood pressure is taken with a cuff on the uh, dominant or on the uh, left arm typically. Sometimes they use the right arm as well, but usually left arm. Hypercholesterolemia or testing for cholesterol is taken with a blood test. And uh, if their total cholesterol is above 200, that's concerning. The greater number is above 240. That's the particularly high number that is very concerning from a medical standpoint. Uh, HDL, high-density lipoproteins, should be at least 40, okay? Uh, LDL to LHDL ratio. The low-density lipoproteins should not be more than three and a half times the number of HDL, okay? If that is the case, there is a potential concern here for triglycerides, for high cholesterol, and that might be a point of wanting to make sure that the person sees a doctor to make sure everything's okay in that regard. It's not an immediate standpoint uh, focus to stop everything if their cholesterol is high, but if they're not sure what to do about it, never had advice from a doctor on that, I want to make sure they get that checked out, okay? Uh, impaired fasting glucose. If they are blood sugar levels, sugar in the blood, uh, is basically impaired. It's not normal. It's above 100 or below 85. Again, taken from a blood test by a doctor. Okay, um, for above 100 consistently on a regular basis, they might be diabetic. For below 85, um, consistently on a regular basis, they might be hypoglycemic. Diabetes referred to as hyperglycemia. Right? They might have an unusual circumstance or something going on with them. They have a they're under medical care from some other problem that's short term, and maybe the blood sugar uh, is off as a re as a result of it. That's why in most situations, just like every situation we're talking about here, most doctors will monitor someone's health over a period of months before making a determination that they have quote blood pressure and need, need medication, or they have high cholesterol and need medication, or they are diabetic. Those kinds of statements don't usually uh, come aren't usually come too quickly. Honestly, if they come too quickly, I would consider getting a second opinion 
on that. Uh, a doctor you meet one time and they test your blood glucose levels and they're measured high or low, or cholesterol is high, or blood pressure is high, and they immediately tell you you need medication, I would spend more time talking to a doctor who's willing to spend more time finding out more about you and about what's going on with you and over a period of time before being so quick to jump to the need for medication. But there are going to be certain circumstances where that is the case, that that's necessary, right? Doctor will decide that. That said, as far as lowering blood pressure, lowering cholesterol, lowering blood glucose, or normalizing glucose, we should say, normalizing cholesterol, normalizing blood pressure, blood pressure ideally around 115 over 70, 75, more ideally, cholesterol 150 or below total cholesterol, uh, blood glucose levels and between 85 to 100 meters, uh, 100 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, we're talking about uh, their blood glucose levels should be at that level after about eight hours of not eating anything. They should still be between 85 to 100. Okay, those numbers, having them be normalized. There's no question. Four things have a big impact on it: your sleep, your nutrition, what you take in, your diet, right, your exercise, and life stress. They all play a role with these factors. No question about it. You can see ups and downs relative to any one of these four factors. If your brain goes to any one of those four as being the most important one, you may not be wrong. Each individual is a little different, and maybe some people are going to have one of those four be more significant than the other. Here's the thing. Of those four things, the thing that you start doing today and keep consistent with every day that's going to have the greatest impact on those three factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, and glucose levels, uh, is not what people want to go to first. They want to go diet first. Oh, of course you got to eat well. Of course you do. That goes without saying. But the one that's actually going to help your glucose levels remain normalized on a regular basis and keep your cholesterol normalized and keep your blood pressure health normalized and help you get better sleep and make you more likely to want to eat better and lower your daily stress is exercise. We need all four. Don't ever think that what we just said there is you don't focus on all four things because you better focus on all four. Not just diet and exercise, you better be adding on top of that sleep and life stress, okay? But the most significant one that can start today and make a dramatic impact in the next few days or a few weeks is going to be adding an exercise, okay? At the right level, that comes with program design. We haven't gotten there yet for figuring out what level we're talking about here, okay? Um, obesity. If their BMI, body mass index, is above 30 or greater, they're considered to be overweight or obese, okay? Now, someone who's highly muscular, like a bodybuilder, some people would argue that, well, they're not really obese, they're not overly fat. They're big, but they're not overly fat. True. And certainly that's not going to be the same as someone who's overly fat uh, versus someone who's just really muscular and big. That said, BMI is an important number to understand. What the basic number is really trying to say is bigger people. People have big, greater body mass for their height. Generally speaking, don't live as long. It's just that simple. Is it always true? No. There's exceptions to every rule, right? But generally speaking, it's a concerning point. That's also why BMI being high or obesity in general as a singular factor is not that significant. But when it's coupled with other problems, it becomes a major concern that contributes to other future problems. That's why we focus on it. Unfortunately, in this uh, Western society, we spend far too much time worrying about uh, whether or not someone's fat or not fat or fit or muscular enough. Unfortunately, it becomes more too much too much toward aesthetics, which is really unfortunate. It really should be about health and well-being, um, all good parameters and everything else. You feel good. You can do things. You're not hindered physically to be able to do things. Uh, and there's no particular health concerns, blood-related, uh, hormonal-related, nervous system-related. You're fairly strong, good conditioning. If those are the case and you're a little bit bigger, not that big of a deal probably in the whole scope of things. But it is one number, like every other number, that we want to take into account in the product of everything. Take everything into account when it comes to BMI, body mass, weight. It's important to take all those things in into individually with the factors of everything included. Okay. That said, better probably a better way to look at obesity or potential concerns with weight is waist size. When a female's waist size is generally speaking, generally speaking, 35 inches or more, or a male waist size is above 40 inches, and more significantly, if ever you find where someone's waist size, belly button essentially, is bigger than their hips, uh, larger than, that's a particularly important concern, and that's one to make sure if that person seen a doctor about any potential concerns uh, beyond of, of other parameters of health, if they've not had a full checkup very, very recently. Okay. Uh, that said, sedentary lifestyle. If they don't participate in a regular exercise program, uh, that's sedentary lifestyle. Well, everybody sits. Some people sit more than others. But if they're not also engaging in a regular exercise program, that's what makes them sedentary. Okay. 
Uh, then here's a sample of a medical clearance form that once you make the determination to get medical clearance from your client before moving forward with the program, make sure that the person has uh, got this, we've gotten this back before you start forward with the program. Once you say, I want medical clearance, um, then you want to make sure this form gets signed by the doctor before you move forward with the program. This is the sample. You can create your own. Your club who you work for might have one already for you, but you got to make sure you get it back. Whether you have to call the doctor yourself or have your client, their patient, your client, call them to get that, that uh, form back. Whatever it takes, get the form back so you make sure you get the important information you need before beginning or moving forward with the program. Okay. A few things we're going to assess um, as a sum total of all the things we assess. There's a lot of things to assess. In most cases, most programs don't assess resting heart rate. You should. Blood pressure, weight, body fat, girth measurements, size, balance and posture. Take a look at someone's basic uh, balance, the ability to maintain the position in space. Very simple little single leg exercise we'll use. Uh, posture for being able to make, what's your basic uh, go-to position when you're standing up. You know, if they have a lot of issues where they're deviating from anatomical neutral, we want to make note of that because it's almost guaranteed if they're deviating from anatomical neutral while standing there that they're more likely to do that when they're under load or under significant stress. And although they may have the capacity to go from rounded forward to upright, if their great regular normal standing position is somewhat leaned forward or the head is forward or their shoulders are round, rotated internally, any number of things that, that deviate from neutral, that's a potential concern. Not by itself a concern, a concern in the sum total of everything we look at. Flexibility and mobility, we use a simple squat test. It is not the end-all be-all. There are so many tests you could be doing from a standpoint of overall assessment of mobility and flexibility. There, You could find any number of 30 to 50 or more tests probably to be using and probably should use when you start getting really in-depth focus on someone's overall mobility and flexibility. We're just talking about the very basic standpoint of a starting position to recognize someone's capacity to be able to sit and stand with good basic form, right? Can they do that basic concept? Such a fundamental movement in terms of typical strength training for lower body, let alone involvement in the core, right? Uh, that said, that's one test we'll talk about, and we'll get some, some references to other tests as well, but that's just the beginning standpoint. Muscular strength and endurance tests, we refer to four specifically, to doing uh, basically one test of upper body push, one test of upper body pull, uh, one core test, and one leg strength test. Some people would say, you don't want to do anything like that the first time out, you know, be doing only flexibility and mobility work before determining whether they're ready for this kind of work. Wouldn't disagree with that, generally speaking, simply understanding that if the person has basic mobility, basic ability to move, we can do some basic testing of strength and endurance, because here's the thing. Uh, if a person doesn't have a better overall understanding of what's really going on with them and how much everything plays a role, how little things of their flexibility can affect their strength, how having some poor mobility can affect their balance, how maybe having larger girth may be affecting their endurance or their mobility, all these things that play a role affecting each other, so we test and assess or evaluate more things so they go away with, oh my gosh, I have so much information now. I, have, I don't even know where to start. I have so much I have to do. It's kind of what we want to do. Not trying to overwhelm them specifically, but make sure they understand that this information by itself can be, and maybe, maybe a little bit should be overwhelming because there's too much to do, and nobody is successful at getting anything significant on their own. If you find anyone who is particularly successful in something they do, they're making a tremendously large income. Uh, they're just the one that people look to as being the top in their field. No one got there by doing self-study in a room by themselves uh, with reading books and didn't ever go anywhere and work with people or get some ideas from somebody else and get help along the way. Everyone does. And the people who want the best results are the ones who have more people helping them, not less. Okay. That said, last of our, our assessments is aerobic capacity. Assessing someone's basic uh, ability to utilize oxygen. If we get them out of breath, we've exceeded their aerobic capacity from a general standpoint when we're training people, right? Uh, their capacity, their ability to perform work for a lengthy period, how far they can go or how fast they can go. Those are things we want to look at as well as everything else that we're going to assess. So a lot of things to assess, a lot of things to take a look at. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about each individual assessment. That's We're trying to keep these videos under 20 minutes apiece, keep you a good focus point, keep you uh, focused and energetic throughout. Uh, take a little break and go on to video three.